Um, I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves for this next panel, which is all about pre- and post-game shows. We've talked a lot about the actual game coverage so far today. This is going to talk about what happens before the game, what happens after the game, and how you get your fans tuned into both of those, uh, both of those shows and how you really make sure that those shows are the best that they can be. So I'm going to start with, uh, to my left with uh, Dave. Just say, a little, uh, say your name, a little bit about uh, what you do. Hi, everybody. My name is David Hoffman with Brainstorm USA. We're a software manufacturer for real-time graphics and fully immersive uh, virtual sets, which is why I would be here, the uh, virtual set side of the thing. Uh, Doug Johnson, executive producer in Pittsburgh. We do Pirates and Penguins coverage. Uh, Tom Stathakis with NBC Sports Regionals. I oversee programming and news for the NBC Sports Regionals. Howard, Howard Zalkowitz, director of production, senior coordinating producer for Nesson. Excellent. All right, so I'm going to start off the panel with kind of a really broad question, and then we're going to dive more into specifics. What is the purpose of having a pre- and post-game show, other than just filling the hours on your respective networks? Uh, I guess I'll start. Um, you know, basically to support the game product, and we've all been talking today, and we've heard several times that, you know, the most important thing that any of us do as a regional is our game. And, you know, the pre- and post-game show, would, I would consider the second, uh, secondary shows that we carry. If you look at our ratings, Obviously, our games are our highest rated uh, product, and our pre- and post-game shows are, you know, probably our second highest rated product. So, you know, they serve the purpose as, you know, leading into the game and also, you know, telling the stories after the game as well with the pre- and post. So, you know, in a nutshell, in a simple version, that's, that's really the why. Well, plus contractually, probably with all of our teams. But, you know, it's, it's really to kind of enhance the game product. I think for us, I mean, clearly it was a business decision when we first started. We knew when we, we have 22 iconic brands uh, that we're partners with. And we just felt it was really important for the fan base to give them as much as we possibly can every night when our teams are playing. Mm -hmm. You know, in Boston, New England, we have a fervent, uh, intelligent fan base. We have a hyper com uh, competitive market. Uh, Pre-game and post-game uh, not only funnels, uh, you know, uh, the audience to the game, but it really serves a purpose to enhance our brand, to uh, provide our audience access to players. And uh, there is a monetary reason for it as well from a sales perspective. For Red Sox, for instance, we have two pre-games and two post-games, and we have entitlement sponsors for each. So as part of the package, they get uh, entitlement reads in-game, which is highly valued. So there is a uh, uh, tremendous uh, value to, uh, to our business aspect as well, including our audience. Great. Um, okay, let's, let's start with pre-game show, because obviously there are big philosophical differences between the pre and the post game show and the way they're structured and what you're looking to accomplish with them. Um, the three of you are responsible for multiple teams and Tom, you're responsible for multiple markets. Uh, what would you say your approach to the pre game show is depending on whether it's a, you know, baseball game, football, or not football, we'll get to that in a second, baseball, hockey, or in Tom, in your case, you've got multiple markets, you know, Phillies versus you know, Golden State Warriors. So let's... Uh... Well, I think, you know, it goes back to what John Slobakin was saying before. We don't view it as an A property or B property, right? Mm -hmm. Every single show we take really serious. We have a, a huge investment in pregame, postgame, and news. And within that investment, we have a lot of employees and a lot of people that take it very serious. And we just don't, we just don't mail in shows, and it's hard. We like a mash unit. When you have, in San Francisco, you have four or five teams. And every night it becomes, it is MASH. It's like you have a game every night. We do 2,500 games. We do 25,000 hours of programming. I think for us, it's every single show that we do, we try to deliver to the fans. And, and now, more important than ever, I mean, uh, you know, we're losing slubs, subs. We talked about it. People aren't plugging. So what can we do, not just in that window, but all day long to make sure we're delivering great product for our fans? Because we really can't afford to lose anyone. So, you know, I think... The approach that we had in 97 and in 2000 when we kept adding regionals is totally different now because the audience is so fragmented. What can we do now? It's almost, when we started in 97, it was a, it was a brand new business and, and, and most of our cities are underserved in Philly. We were, you know, people were doing three minutes of sports. Mm -hmm. Anchors getting paid a lot of money doing three minutes of sports. And then uh, at that time, Brian Roberts, Jack Williams and the team owner said that we want to start a regional sports network because our fans were underserved. And I think now we're trying to figure out maybe with their, now they're underserved and even more in this landscape of, of so many different ways to communicate that we're really looking at our business in a totally different way. You know, I think, you know, speaking of philosophy, 
you know, pre and post game shows share the, uh, the common bridge of the same game, but yet, you know, they're, they're both distinctively separate shows. Um, you know, post game shows very reactionary, um, kind of, you know, there's, there's some inherent things that you have to commit to, to to deliver to the fans in every post game show. The pre game show, on the other hand, is I, I kind of view it as just a big ball of clay. And it really is up to the producer to come up with what they want in that show, because there's so many different directions you can go in with that show. Um, that, to me, the pregame show is really the area where you can start to tell some of the stories away from the X's and O's. I think the postgame show is very X's and O driven. I think that's what the fans crave and that's what they need. They need that immediate reaction to what, what happened on the field. Uh, they need to hear from the coaches, the players, and everything else. The pregame show is a little bit more looser, and it gives you the opportunity to get to know the players. Um, you know, I've always said, you know, people root for who they like, so make me like these guys. Um, so I think that's really where you get that, that 22 minutes of content where you can really tell the stories of the players while also kind of getting into the story of the game. So it's a 50-50 mix on our air of telling stories off the field, telling stories on the field as well. Um, also the pace of the pregame show, I like it to be, you know, in postgame is so much, a little bit more, but there's more analysts in a postgame show. I think the pregame show really has to have a little bit of more of a faster pace. Um, you know, for most of our shows, you won't really see our talent on camera more than 20, 30 seconds at a time. And even when they're on camera, we'll have a jib move. So there's always movement in the show to kind of keep pushing folks, keep pushing towards that 7 o'clock first pitch um, with that to kind of build the momentum leading up to it. So, again, two distinctive uh, different shows, but all bridged by the same game. We teach our producers to be programmers in many ways because pregame, your audience builds toward the end. So you almost have to think counterintuitively. You know, producers think about, oh, let's build the start of my show, and that's my most important elements, and we kind of uh, go from there. But you really have to have format balance. Well, in post game, you really have that one chance to keep the audience where attention is so important, especially for Nesson, where we have two post game shows followed by a nightly news show afterwards. And so retaining the audience, we do something called the stealth toss, where our, uh, where our announcers, uh, our play-by-play -play is just kind of talking to our uh, host, uh, studio host, and our studio host is basically taking the baton. A lot of times you will see our walk-off or a video, uh, a minute, minute and a half of video before we even get on camera into the studio, just so people think that they are uh, seamlessly going from game to post game and really to really dive into the matter of consequence first and to try to keep that audience there as much as possible is so important. So it is a totally different mindset uh, programming pregame to pro programming post game and how you have to in program retain, retain, retain. You know, retention is so important. Teasing what's coming next is, is something that we ingrain into our producers uh, while in pregame it's teasing what's to come to build toward the, uh, toward the game. That's, a, that's actually a great point. You know, it's, I'm starting to see more and more regions do that, which is a great idea. And we, we started doing it a few years ago. Is Basically, it's one product. It's, it's starting at 6.30 all the way till 11.15. It's one, basically one show. Um, Pre-game does the handoff to the game. Um, and then as soon as the game's over, they toss directly to the post-game show before you take that break. Because I was never a fan of when the game ends going to break. That's basically telling everybody at home, just go watch something else. So hand off to the post-game guys, do two or three-minute segment, tease the post-game show, and then take that end-of-game adjacency break. I think the days of assuming that everybody's just going to watch post-game, unless it's the Golden State Warriors or the Cubs, probably, is not really accurate anymore. So I think, as a group, we have to do a better job in-game to drive people to post-game mm -hmm. by either social media or polls or something, because we do a lot of traditional broadcasts. We have a lot of people who have been in, you know, in our group for a very long time. So I think it goes back to a conversation someone had before. We're trying to really you know, change some habits. And we're working on that on daily because, you know, I think one of the good things about our business is we don't have a ton of turnover in our rooms, but also that's a bad thing too because times are changing mm -hmm. and we need to change with them. So we're trying to, we're really actively trying to figure that out going into how, what can we do in games to make sure people will watch post game. And to build on what Tom said, one device that we uh, implemented with Nesson last year was that in Bruins telecasts, uh, our talent, uh, our booth talent, uh, Jack Edwards and Andy Brickley would interview Claude Julian after the game. And we promote that in the third period. And whether it was a, a win or a loss, you know, the way they could frame the questions and talk to Claude and get honest answers became pretty much must-see must television. It was at the end of our first segment. It kept people there and it, was, uh, it worked in kind of that seamless one telecast perspective that I think Tom spoke so eloquently about. Uh, we're going to get back into the topic of production in just a second, but I want to bring in uh, David at this point. 
you're hearing that you know there's a huge difference between the pre and the post game show, not only in terms of the content, but also in terms of the feel of the show. Talk a little bit about how virtual sets are really kind of you know helping helping this along. Right. So as a as a manufacturer, a tool manufacturer, essentially, we're providing these gentlemen with the techniques and technologies for them to be able to do what they're talking about, and that is keep the keep the audience engaged. Um, because our, our tool is primarily a software-based implementation and we can make fully immersive environments, we can continue to change the way the, the, the product is looking to the audience, continuing to refresh that as you move through that baton handoff and you go show to show to show. Uh, so then we've got this opportunity here where you can make it look fresh without having to cut to a completely different setup or a completely different environment. Even when you're on a live uh, fan engagement, uh, as, as we talked about in, in one of our pre-calls, where you're out there and you want to be engaged with the fans, you want to have that relationship, that one-to-one -one relationship, even though you're bringing that back, you can still implement graphics that are not obscuring that view, not obscuring that experience by putting it on the downstream key and, and taking up you know, finite real estate there. You can actually start putting it into the shot itself so that it's there, you can move in on it, your camera can pull back and go back to your fan engagement. So these are just new and emerging technologies uh, that hopefully uh, get, get you know, into your workflow. You can use them to find ways to change the product, evolve the product, and, and continue to listen to what your customers are asking for, your, you know, your clients, your viewers, as well as giving them something fresh that they may not have seen before that feeds into that ball of clay versus reactionary kind of experience. The ball of clay, you have total control over it and you can build that into it, but then you need to be able to pivot and, and react to whatever uh, the outcome of the game is, and the virtual technology, the real-time graphics technologies, give you some of those capabilities. Uh, and I'll ask the other panelists, are you guys using any sort of virtual sets or any other sort of tools to help your viewers discern visually the difference between pre and post or the difference between the various sports? We have a, vir we have, uh, at our Watertown studios, we have two hard, uh, we have a hard set and we have a virtual set. The hard set is used for road, pre and post games and for home uh, Red Sox post game shows. We have a virtual set uh, for our news shows. We have three news shows a, uh, a day that uh, service not only to add to our Red Sox and Bruins coverage but also for Patriots, Celtic and, and college sports. So uh, we made a, a determined choice to use the flexibility of the virtual set building a hyper real uh, New England type warehouse of steel and brick and uh, everything but snow. Uh, in our news environment as opposed to our pre-post? We do not. We try to, we create movement by using different parts of the studio, but we do not use virtual. Okay. Uh, we don't use anything virtual right now. I mean, to me, research virtual years ago was mostly based on physical space that we had in the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in a uh, previous position where we had a smaller studio, so it was looking to make a 20 foot by 20 foot space look like a 60 foot by 60 foot space virtually. Um, where I think I really like the virtual is when you integrate it with an existing set. When I think that's some of the stuff you're talking about, yeah, where you right. have an existing set that looks really nice, and yet you have the virtual aspects of things you know, popping up out of the floor, mm -hmm. things like that. I think that's really where I, I see the future of uh, virtual for us. Yeah, and when we talk about that, so you know, some of the terminology, you know, we've learned some new terminology, uh, at least I have today, about the at-home uh, thing. But when, when we talk about that, that that's called you know, augmented reality or mixed reality in, in this case. So virtual reality has been a term that's been around for a very long time. And that generally refers to a fully immersive environment where the talent's on the green space and we would replicate uh, a, some kind of set design, either uh, practical looking or, or completely synthetic. But augmented reality has been one that's been employed uh, very aggressively by uh, other broadcasters for, for quite some time now. And they find that that is a much more uh, I I um, approachable way of getting this technology out there, where now you're putting statistics on some kind of graphic element that's tracking with the camera in a real space. And, you know, and, and that way they can have different kinds of uh, effects like fold down screens or pop up panels or statisticals uh, like you're seeing with uh, MLB Network where they're having uh, talent walk out to a stage and then having the player profiles being presented as, as animated real movies being walked out from the screen into the studio and back again from baseball card to live you know, you know, person being there. Those kind of things are, 
are uh, fantastic and it's easier for the talent to get behind that and it's easier for the production teams to visualize and, and, and work with that without having to you know, hack off a bunch of green space. Um, although in, in Watertown they were successful in doing that and giving a very big green screen space and utilizing that, not everybody can do that. And are there any other, um, let's say, production tools that you guys should really use to enhance your broadcast? Obviously, you're not going to use a super slow-mo camera in a post-game show unless it's to just show replays. Um, what would you, what, do you, what kind of tools do you guys use to, I guess, just tell the story of the game or, you know, before the game to kind of uh, get fans excited about it? I think traditionally, you know, we, we're always in the locker room, mm -hmm. you know, getting players and managers. But I think, you know, we... I probably collectively as a group would agree. We talk to the fans all the time, and I think we're in a day and age now we need to talk with them. We have a lot of rating points inside of stadiums. Can you imagine that they walk out and they can get on their mobile phone and ask a question directly to our post game people? And I think we're you know we're looking at things like that. I think people can get manager sound bites, and people can get that from other places. So mm -hmm. we're we're I keep hate to keep harping on it, but we're trying to figure out ways to keep our audience and not just assume that they're going to be there. And I think talking with our fans instead of to our fans is something we're really going to work hard at. One of the tools we use, and it's, it's something that's been around for a while, but started using the last couple of years, and it's become pretty popular on post-game shows. Uh, we have an 80-inch touchscreen telestrator that, you know, it was one of those things we thought we would just go to the analysts, you know, using it in the post-game show, and then we would just take it full, but he got so good at it, you know, engaging with people that it become we just stay on the camera now, and it's something we use in, in almost every one of our post-game shows. And we, we use uh, Chiron Higo Paint, uh, basically an enhanced telestrator uh, for both remote and studio. Uh, it's set up in, for home games, it's set up uh, at the truck, so it can be uh, duly purposed. Uh, we have a backup return line that can be sent down for studio. And then for stu uh, away games, it is set up uh, in our studios, and we have a return line uh, to remote, so we can get a real content efficiency that way. And we had like PR, it's the same type thing. We can move players around, um, and we, I think we all do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, up until this point, we've pretty much focused on studio pre and post game shows. Let's talk about on site for a second. What is your approach and what is your philosophy behind moving your pre or post game show on site? Um, I'll take it. Well, for Bruins, we are on, at TD Garden for home games, and we have a suite that we split. Uh, between the television and client services with sales, so that works out very, very well. Uh, we're there for pre and post. Uh, we have dark fiber from both TD Garden and from our set at Yawkey Way that bypasses the game truck so that we have a control room uh, in Watertown that uh, um, with producer, director, et cetera, uh, that talk directly to the talent. Um, and that, uh, you know, for us, uh, Yawkey Way has become a very iconic shot. We're there for uh, every home game for the Red Sox. Uh, we're there for um, a couple handful of uh, post-game shows and day games. And uh, we have to make a decision every day with regards to weather. You know, the first thing is safety for a crew. So uh, 8 a.m. Uh, for a 1 o'clock game or noon for a 7 o'clock game, a decision is made whether we have to come back and, and be agile enough to do it in Watertown at the studio, but the dark fiber from both uh, uh, Fenway and from the garden to Watertown allows us tremendous amount of uh, content flexibility from a studio perspective and content in independence from a uh, remote perspective as they get ready for uh, their telecast. We're a big believer in it. Uh, people looked at what we did in San Francisco. We put a full basketball court out front for pre and post game. Um, we use an ace ticket studio in Boston. In Wells Fargo Center in Philly, we set up in the atrium. And anytime you can be that close to your fans, I mean, there are days for our Eagles pregame show in Philadelphia, we might have 5,000 fans behind the stands. Mm -hmm. We just have security there. But to be that close with your fan interaction and get, get the mode, you know, get the, just the emotion off of that with the stadium behind you, it, it just makes your show so much better than inside the studio. Now, we don't do it all the time. We do it for football in most of our markets. Um, playoff games, we try, to, we try to be with the people as much as we can. Mm -hmm. As much as we can. Uh, the perfect pre and post game location on set to me is or on site at the uh, arenas. The win win really is when you have the, the ice or the arena or the field behind the guys, plus you have fan interaction as well. Preferably the fan interaction behind the camera so you can control it a little bit better as opposed to behind your talent. Um, but that's tough in a lot of buildings. I mean, Consol, for example, where the Penguins play, is one of the tightest NHL buildings around. And right now we're in an in zone position there. 
uh, where we get an amazing shot of the ice, but there's very little fan interaction uh, with that. So it's not it's not the perfect situation. So to me, it's either you get you know the field of the ice behind them, or you, or you get some sort of, like you're saying outside, you get some fan interaction as well, which is awesome for post game shows and pregame shows um, with that as well. And, and the other thing that we do, you know, bottom off what they say is you know the the, the dark fiber that we have. Um, all of our home shows, the talent are on site at the arena, but they're all produced back at our studios on the North Shore in Pittsburgh. Um, to me, that is key because, you know, we talk about, and you've heard it several times a day, that the game's the most important thing. You know, some people say, well, why are you spending the money to, you know, to make the pre- and post-game show that better? Well, I'll argue the other way, saying you're paying that money to make the game that much better because, you know, from being in the truck before when I've had to direct pre-game shows and then, oh, yeah, you got to do a game and then you got to do a 45-minute post-game show as well. Um, by doing that and, and fibering everything back and the truck really not even knowing that a pre and post game show is going on other than they have to put the talent up for a segment, um, really helps the truck, you know, and the, and the equipment in the truck, the, you know, the Duet doesn't have three masters anymore, the EVS doesn't have three masters, it's got just the game, which is the 800 pound gorilla, and then you've got the pre and post game show dedicated staff back at the crew, or at the, uh, at the studio um, that takes care of that. To me, that has really uh, been the key to success because, you know, you really limit all three shows when you try to do them all out of one truck, and I know that, that each region has its own economic reasons why they do it, but just from a production standpoint, again, what's the most important thing we do? It's the game. So enhance that game. You know, in hockey, we do intermissions as well, so that allows the crew to, to take the intermission off and really, you know, be shot out of a cannon to start the second and third period when we start these games, and it's really made a distinct difference in the productions. And uh, Tom and Howard, is that something that, a philosophy that you're employing of the, it is part of the entire production, but at the same point, you keep the pre-intermission and post-game separate to kind of give those game guys a little bit of a breather? I think you put them in a bad spot if you constant, if your game announcers are going to do your post-game show. Mm -hmm. um, that's a bad position for them to be in. Um, we are advocates for the teams, but we also try to be in certain markets in Boston, you know, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago. You just can't come out, you know, if they get whacked 7 nothing and say, tough night. I mean, we're careful, but your announcers work for the teams. So we try to separate that. We try to have analysts um, that are separate from team announcers. And I agree with the truck situation. Um, that's a lot of work to do in those two and three hour periods. And then there's getaway games where they got to get out of there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's much better to be isolated inside the studio. You know, we integrate our, our remote announcers into our studio telecasts. Um, for Bruins, when we're home and we have our on-site at the garden of the suite, uh, our Andy Brickley, our, our remote analyst, will come on for the first segment of a uh, uh, pregame, but then he'll go uh, and prepare for the game. In postgame for the Red Sox, in the first segment, we've been bringing the analyst into the postgame in the first segment. Uh, it's it, Again, it, it goes to that one uh, telecast kind of philosophy, and it's gotten some pretty good interaction and stimulated some interesting conversations and a directional flow. You know, this is... Uh, is somebody who's watched the game for like three, three and a half hours and can kind of boil down all the nuances of what's happened in the game. Um, so, you know, but a, a, as, you know, Doug and I have talked, the, the dark fiber uh, has been a game changer for us. It's been a philosophy that Nesson has employed for uh, a number of years, and uh, it's allowed us to do many uh, items from a content perspective, both in remote and studio, that otherwise we feel it would have been a bigger challenge. And it prevents, you know, end of game stuff. I remember how many times when you're, you're, you know, directing or producing a baseball game, and it's the seventh or eighth inning, and it's a one-run game, and it's the most important, it's the highest-rated part of your game. And there's times when you're, you know, you yell back to the EBS guy, "Hey, can I get this package?" He's like, "I'm oh, sorry, I was busy building post-game highlights." And it's just like that fighting, constantly back and forth, that uh, by having that dark fiber really, really prevents. It's human nature. If you're doing a game for three hours, uh, and my feeling is that they honestly probably don't give a shit, really, for post-game, yeah. right? They're worried about what they're doing next. And for us, um, it's a major part of what we do. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not just that, you know, pre-game, post-game, but, you know, we're trying to build our brand up, and we, everything's, we just, we have to be better. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, before we continue, are there any questions? Oh, one right there. Four. Thank you. Oh, he's getting the mic. I think it's project. There you go. Following up on what Doug was saying about overworking the, the actual game crew, uh, how much of your post-game elements from the truck 
are fed and time shifted and how much are live because I've been in enough trucks where the production crew, your producer and director who have already been there for 12 hours are trying to pack up everything and get on the team bus in time to get to the next city. Uh, it depends if it's home versus road. If it's if it's at home, we have 16 lines coming back from each building, so basically every camera. So they're, the EVS back in the building, they're cutting everything themselves. The only thing that the truck feeds is the end of game rollout that they've built throughout the game. So uh, road, they feed a couple packages. Sometimes we'll try to do stuff in breaks later in the game um, to help out certain things, maybe starting pitcher stuff. But it really is studio centric. A studio really handles a lot of the different uh, packages and try not to uh, tax the truck too much. Do you usually take the announcers? Uh, through the truck, and then if there's an end of the game interview, walk off homer, they'll do that. And uh, I would like that to be in post game, but more times than not, it's at the end of the game, in the game. Um, but uh, we get announcer hits from them; they just don't lead it. We use that where we want. You know, we use we have our reporter, our photog has live view, so when we get uh, sound, it doesn't go through the truck; it can come right, uh, right back to us. Uh, we have at home; we also have uh, fire at the dugout. We need to use that. Uh, we try to be as independent as possible with the truck um, after the first uh, post-game segment with the analyst. A question back here. Hey, Doug. I'm just curious, now that you have a championship hockey team under your belt, <laughs> how much of a challenge the last couple of years and how much more of a challenge will it be next year having access to that team with their uh, you know, top-notch general manager? Uh, you know what, I, I, I don't see it being too much of an issue. I mean, especially with the local, you know, with our talent that have been in, embedded with them for years now. I mean, I don't, I mean, you really did see it when, you know, we watched the over-the-air folks, you know, do some post-game coverage, how much they did not know the players and how much they didn't know Jim Rutherford. Um, but our folks from Dan Potas, our silent reporter, has been embedded with that team for like 15 years now. Um, I don't see it being an issue at all with, with going forward with them. It actually gives us more to talk about. It's uh, also the 50th anniversary of the team coming up, so there's a lot of plans around that. So, you know, good partnership with the Penguins and, and, and you know, kind of being in touch with what they want and what they need um, really helps us and tell their story, and they kind of give us what we need as well. Good partnership. Uh, I'd like to bring up uh, something that uh, I know we had discussed earlier, and uh, Howard, I'll have you start. How much of your production is automated, and how much do you rely on production automation tools? Um, well, this year, Nesson uh, invested in uh, control room automation, and we made a uh, huge reimagining of roles and responsibilities, uh, a seismic shift in workflow. Um, we, uh, we have automated all our new shows, and now our pre-game, intermission, and post-game shows. Uh, we did a real systematic approach to this. We looked at, uh, we went to different uh, news stations around New England last summer. Uh, we looked uh, across departmentally at uh, different systems. We ended up uh, purchasing uh, Ross uh, Overdrive, Ross Expression, Ross Acuity, uh, um, a switcher, uh, robotic cameras. And uh, then it was a systematic approach to say, okay, let's get Ross and EMPS uh, talking, we got them uh, con conversing, we got Ross, EMPS, and our Sony Playout system uh, discussing everything, talking, and then we had to shift our entire graphic package uh, over to Ross Expression, uh, building the templates, uh, and then figuring out, okay, everybody now has to do different workflows. So, for example, in the old way, uh, or in the, the traditional way, you'd have a uh, character generator operator and a graphics PA. Now we have one graphics producer who sits at a computer and through the Moss Gateway system and EMPS and templates with Ross Expression uh, builds graphics that gets sent into the EMPS and gets played out through uh, Ross Overdrive. Um, it has been a real, um, real shift in mindset uh, from producer director, how people converse in the control room, uh, and we, we were really, you know, we had to say, okay, how do we go about doing this? Because uh, So the first way we did it was we decided, okay, let's go all, do all our news shows first. And because we did all this changeover in the wintertime, where we had, uh, we have news 365 days a year, but we had, you know, dark days at Bruins. We were able to have real understanding of how to rehearse and how to piecemeal uh, do this process. 
um, so that we could become subject matter experts. So we ended up uh, audit first automating our news shows, then automating our pregame intermissions, and finally auto automating our postgame shows. And um, you know there was uh, there was learnings to be done. Uh, there were, uh, for example, it's no longer really a director but a pilot and a co-pilot. And uh, there's, uh, we have content producers now. We've had a whole change in our mindset of how do we integrate the content center with the control room. Uh, to think that, that the graphics are done from a computer in the content center where they're on headset and they're watching the feed versus in the control room. It's been a, it's been a big shift. We've put a lot of, uh, about 70% of our show is on teleprompter. When it's not on teleprompter, uh, when something is not on teleprompter, it still says ad lib so that the, co the pilot can follow along with uh, automation with the production cues. And uh, it has really cleaned up our shows a lot. Uh, for any trepidation that we've had, we've been, uh, we're now very bullish on automation uh, with sports television. Okay. Um, we're splintered. In some places we have robotics, some places we don't. Uh, most of our producers just put the graphics in themselves. Um, uh, we're sort of, we're a little different. We have master control in some buildings and some buildings we don't. Mm -hmm. um, we're, uh, we're sort of all over the place. No, not much use for automation. We don't, we're not a news organization. We don't do a news show. It's pre-game and post for us, uh, basically, is our main, main shows. So we really haven't had the need to sort of condense things and, and, and automate them as well. I mean, we've, we do have some things that enhance our shows, a uh, cameo system that, you know, helps uh, our producer and director follow along. We have monitors all over our studio that, you know, once the story changes, they can, at the hit of a button, can completely wipe the, the monitors and send them to the next, uh, next player panels as well. So just things like that to enhance our, our current products. For, from a technological standpoint, I'll refer back to one of the earlier panels where uh, Gerard Hall was speaking from SMT, and, and there was a conversation about how uh, some of the TDs are under, you know, kind of coming under task saturation. They're being overwhelmed by all the different things that are being asked to do, and more is being put on their plate. And his response was that through automation and the use of, of you know, the real-time graphics engines that they use and things like that, this technology can then be taken out of a micro uh, interaction where they're calling in specific graphic sets and looking at managing the specific data sets and things like that to a more of a macro. And, and what's Howard's describing as the pilot co-pilot, they're basically hitting a space key. A lot of the work's being done uh, through AI or some kind of automation on the back end or even further back to uh, their home base where they're, they're having graphics operators, you know, kind of managing in the graphics and at the, at the point of inflection to the, to the viewer, the, 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 the TD or the, or the pilot then, I guess, is really creating a macro event. So where it's not as complete uh, automation as Howard describes it at Nesson, um, it will allow for a flexible uh, scaling of, of, of uh, you know, production velocity at that, at that point. And there's still, even in automation, there's still, um, you know, creativity and uh, we haven't taken the, the, the person out of it. I mean, the director or the pilot now has to, you know, switch cameras on a keyboard or a shot box. Uh, you know, we have EVS, but instead of, uh, you know, when you put into the EMPS system, uh, I want, uh, I'm the producer and it's going to be EVS package in this line, EVS package two in this line, EVS package in three, uh, this line, it's the source that is being automated. What the content is in the source is up to the producer's discretion. So, um, you know, it, it, just because you're automated doesn't mean that you've taken out the human factor. It actually has become cleaner shows for us and people are, I think, more concise uh, with their language and, and their cadence is better. You haven't completely deployed the uh, robot overlords then? Is that what you're saying? Not, not yet, no, no, not all AI. <laughs> uh, all right, I'd like to talk a little bit about conflicts between the sports. As we all know, regional sports networks, you're not just handling one sport all year round. You've got basketball, hockey, baseball, even football post game, which we'll get into in just a second. Um, how do you handle when you've got hockey season running up to, to baseball season, baseball season running into football season, and then that running into basketball and you know hockey season again. How do you manage when you've got multiple games going on at the same time? Which ones, which sports take precedence, and what do you do with the other sports pre and post game shows? Uh, for us, with uh, Pirates and Penguins, uh, 
penguins take priority. Uh, mm -hmm. We have just the one channel. We did have just the one channel uh, leading up to this year, but you know, right now the penguins take priorities. Uh, a small prayer to the schedule gods that it works mm -hmm. out, but a lot of times we'll usually end up with one or two conflicts in April, the start of baseball um, with that. So with that being said, we'll, we'll pick up later games in the season and we'll carry the Penguins games in April. Obviously with the playoff drive for them, it's much more important. Um, so we would drop the Pirates games and pick up the Penguin games. Playoffs always take precedent. So um, we always air the playoff games and then we'll put the other game on a secondary channel. And it sort of works out in reverse in other parts of the season. Um, it's, it's not that difficult really. Mm -hmm. Bruins playoffs go to Nesson and Red Sox regular season go to Nesson Plus. Um, something I alluded to before, Tom, uh, love to hear you talk a little bit more about po pre and post game shows for sports which you do not own the rights to. I'm thinking specifically about obviously the NFL. You know, you're not showing that. You're not showing the Eagles on Comcast Philly, but you're showing the pre and post game. How do you approach that and how do you drive viewers to that post game show when you're not on the air those three hours? I think when we started, we just made a decision that we were going to do it, and we knew we couldn't use video. And in the beginning, we couldn't use the marks and logos of the team. But football is such a driver in our business that we thought we'd gain an audience. And, and really, for two years, to be honest, we didn't really have an audience. We basically did a zero for almost two years after the game. But then, you know, we did a marketing deal in Philadelphia with the Eagles, and then we started getting signage in the stadium. And we were just really patient and persevere with the fact that we thought it was going to work. And it was different. You know, when we, when we started in 97, there weren't, there wasn't all this avenue to get information. So, but we were, we were steadfast in that when the Eagles game went to zero, when that gun went off, it didn't matter what we had on. We could be in the middle of a bike, you know, it's all usually Phil program, right? So we'd be in the middle of a bike race or a magazine show or maybe a bowling or something. And we would just cut out. We would just stop. And we would run right to post game. And by the third year, we started, you know, getting an uptick. And now I think it's something we're really proud of. And I mean, most of our markets, we go from a zero to a two, one and a half, sometimes in some of these markets, a three or a four right away. And um, I think it's something we're really proud of. But it was because I think we had a lot of patience with it. And we realized that the fans would come. It, it, football is such a driver for mm -hmm. what's going on. And pregame, um, frankly, in, in most of our markets, doesn't do as well as postgame. I mean, for us to get a two, we don't do a two in pregame. We'll do a 0 .6, 0 .5. Um, just a lot of stuff going on, you know, at that early in the day, and they know they're going to consume their day. We still do it because we should do it, mm -hmm. but uh, the ratings aren't aren't nearly as high in most of our markets for pregame as they are for postgame. Okay. Um, any questions? One right over here. To me, it's, if it's something that it affects what's happening on the field, it's something we have to talk about. If somebody, you know, for example, gets a DUI and they're not playing that day, that's something we have to talk about. Um, but again, at the end of the day, we're all here to make our teams look good. It's a partnership. We're not media. Um, you know, that's basically the philosophy of, you know, there to make the team look good, but if something happens that impacts something that happens on the field, then it's, it's something we have to address and tell the story and get in and get out quickly. And we have the same philosophy. We just try not to make it personal. You know, if somebody had a bad game, they had a bad game. It's not because they were out at 3 in the morning or, you know, if somebody, you know, it happens, somebody gets a DUI, we don't necessarily go back and start digging up to see if you got one in college or high school. I think at times, um, I think we really walk a fine line and done a good job with that. Uh, I think we don't make it personal. We lay out the facts. And we're no different than anybody else. I, I don't care if you're CBS News and your biggest sponsor is Toyota you're careful about what you say about Toyota if the Toyota news breaks. And I don't care what anybody says. Everybody does it. I think we walk a fine line, but I think we're really good partners. And that relationship with the teams is the most important thing. Well, you know, we don't have, we don't have a business. I think you just have to be smart about it. Um, we're not shills, but we're not stupid either. You know, there are certain talent uh, who can be the same in the green room as when the, and then when the red light is on and the same people, you know. 
but we don't live in the world of Charles Barkley that, that we can do that. But what we can do is we, we still have to be, it's a delicate dance because we you need to be credible to your audience. But you also need to be, you know, affirming to the partnership. So we talk about how you, f uh, with our, our analysts, how you frame it, how you frame the difficult discussions. You know, using video is important if you're gonna if you're gonna be critical. Listening to what the players and the coaches are saying. A lot of times, uh, we'll use something that Claude Julian says to Jack and Brick, and say uh, our reporter will say to our uh, to to a player, you know, Claude said to Jack and Brick, and it's, you know, and Claude's pretty honest, and that'll that'll feed in, uh, you know, a, a real honest response. But, you know, we try, you know, we, we tell them, you know, stick, as what Doug said, stick to what's on the field, but if you can use video evidence to make it a teachable moment, we frame it that way. We, we haven't had many issues with, well, a few being critical. We have more issues when we're multi, you know, when our markets that are multi-sports, that the owners call because why didn't you leave with the Flyers tonight? Or why would you talk about the Phillies? Why did you talk about the Sixers? It's more about story placement than almost what it is. I mean, Joe Banner, the former president of the Eagles, used to come into the newsroom across the street and have a temper tantrum from a whole staff if we levered something else. And it's like, you're like, what are you doing here? You have nothing better to do? But they were more worried about the way we covered them in terms of placement than what necessarily we said. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I think we deal with more than anything is, is in this day and age of Twitter, everybody wants to be first. There's a rumor somebody's going to be traded, you know, and everybody, all the beat writers are out there just throwing stuff against the wall because they want to be first that said it. So that's really where, it, you know, we have to be careful what we say. We don't really comment on things or talk about things like that, especially because you don't want to put a GM in a bad spot by, by enhancing a rumor. And, and us as the broadcasters and the rights holders have the credibility that if we comment on something, it becomes more real. So we have to be careful not to comment on anything unless the team officially says, yes, we're trading this person. So I think that's the one thing that we deal with more day to day than anything is just, just flat out rumors. How has the four, oh, I'm sorry, Howard, did you want to? How have the four of you seen pre and post game coverage uh, evolve in the past five years and how do you think it will evolve in the next five? Or how do you hope it will evolve in the next five? I think social media has made just a giant difference. I mean, if you look at the, if you watch the golf tournament on mm -hmm. Sunday and um, Dustin Johnson, I don't want to bore everybody, but move, move the putter behind the ball, mm -hmm. but move yeah. backwards. And then, literally, during the broadcast, Spieth, Tiger Woods, and McElroy came out and dumped all over the USGA, social media. Well, that's a huge change from five years ago, to have three star athletes come on during, your, um, during the network broadcast and criticize. So the, the pace of play anymore is, it's changed dramatically with social media. I mean, people, different people get involved. And I, I don't know, I mean, um, you know, David says we're in a bullet train. You know, we're on a bull train. I don't know what it's going to look like five years from now. But I know one thing, you can't be wrong. And we're careful with Twitter and Facebook because people are wrong all the time. And there's no accountability for it. And we just try to be really careful about that with our partners. I think whether it was 25 years ago, today, or 25 years from now, I think the one common thread for all pre and post is storytelling and what, what you do to enhance that storytelling. And I think the real difference maker over the last five years has been the, the uh, technology, you know, the advances in technology from super slow-mos to tell the stories in game and also use them in pre and post um, as well. And I think, you know, what we will find in five years is even better technology, you know, that to help us tell those stories. You know, I think that access is so important. And, you know, as the regional sports networks, we have, um, we have access with the team a lot of times that other places don't have. And the more that we can kind of foster that access and, you know, as we go forward, you see much more athlete generated content going on from the Players Tribune to other athletes just using their own social media that I think that that's gonna be a tipping point, how much access that we can get as a regional sports network to kind of create that compelling content and that storylines versus how much the athletes are generating themselves with their own kind of platform. So that to me is going to be very interesting going forward. In the early days when we were doing post game, some of the writers wouldn't participate in the Q&A with the coach because they said it was their intellectual property that we were stealing and putting live on television. <laughs> and now they have their own makeup people and they come in and do our shows. <laughs> so it's changed, you know, quite dramatically. People like being, they realize and then they walk into a store, people know who they are. So that, that changed fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. so one of the things that we see on the technical side of things <clears throat> as we approach say social broadcasters, you know, we see that the technology 
economically and from a, a operational standpoint is getting uh, more approachable. And so you have people like, like you're saying, they, they, they wouldn't even do Q&A, now they're coming in with their own production support teams. We're seeing social broadcasters that may have had a fan channel on, on a, you know, some social network distribution you know, mechanism like YouTube or something are now starting to put their own little micro studios together and they're getting that access uh, to uh, you know, being on the ground there. And, and we, we, we see them using our technology to, to enhance that production level to you know, get into a point where they're competing uh, uh, graphically and, and, and technologically on a single thread channel but you know it's it's something there, and then being able to bring that in as you're talking about the the social feeds coming in, you know, putting the filters on there, and and being able to kind of be uh, cognizant that you're serving apparently, you know, uh, not apparently, you're, you're really serving two uh, groups. Are you're, you're your advocate for the fan, or your advocate for the team, or your advocate for both? Really, I mean, you're you're kind of getting in there. How do you give the fans what they crave without you know uh, doing da damage to your relationship with the team, you know, back and forth? So these technologies of being able to filter that stuff and present it in such a way, that, that's kind of the future going forward is what you know, we've started to see. Um, and we see it starting to get pushed out, uh, certainly in Howard's case, uh, at Nesson quite aggressively. Okay, well, that's about all the time we have. Uh, thank you guys so much for uh, taking part today.